Trapped at the bottom of the Barents Sea, distraught Russian Navy personnel are in a fight to survive as one catastrophe follows another on board their embattled submarine. Each of those men is faced with unimaginable terror. As time passes, the highest echelons of Russian officialdom will lie through their teeth and exhibit startling ineptitude. This will become one of the hardest periods in Vladimir Putin's entire life, and that's saying something. The story begins on August 10, 2000, when the Russian nuclear submarine K-141 Kursk was engaged in naval exercises in the Barents Sea. The Kursk belonged to the Oscar II-class submarine commissioned during the height of the Cold War, designed to take out large enemy ships or aircraft carriers. The Oscar II was powered by an OK-650 nuclear reactor, giving it 97,990 shipboard horsepower and a speed of up to 33 knots when fully submerged. On board, each sub carried 24 P-700 granite missiles, which NATO had given the name SSN-19 Shipwreck. Shipwreck, indeed. These things were 33 feet long, weighing 15,400 pounds, capable of Mach 1.6 speeds, with a range of 388 miles. They could carry conventional high-explosive warheads, but also a 500 kiloton warhead, enough to turn any American ship to dust. These subs were a grand achievement for the Soviets and a major threat to the U.S. Navy. The Kursk was first launched post-Cold War in 1994, but due to a lack of funds for fuel, it rarely saw any action, despite it being one of Russia's most outstanding military machines. The Kursk was so big, as long as two jumbo jets, that there were staterooms for each senior officer. The crew, who back then were paid peanuts if they were paid at all, could enjoy a gymnasium. Although unlike the giant typhoon class, there was no sauna or solarium for those long deployments beneath the sea. Still, the Kursk was a massive piece of machinery, complete with ten separate compartments that could be separated in case something awful should happen. Like the Titanic, the Kursk was called unsinkable, but also, like the Titanic, it definitely was sinkable. In 1999, it was deployed in the Mediterranean Sea with the task of monitoring the United States Sixth Fleet that was responding to the crisis in Kosovo at the time. But for the most part, the Kursk remained unemployed, which meant time gathering dust and crews unable to gain experience on it. In 2000, the Kursk was once again asked to perform. That was after a decade out of action, not counting that short Kosovo deployment. It was time to take part in a large-scale naval exercise, which the Russians named the Summer X Exercise, the biggest naval exercise for many years, costing millions of dollars. It would include 30 Russian ships, including the aircraft carrier Admiral Kuznetsov and the battlecruiser Pyotr Velikitya. Unknown to the Russians, monitoring the exercise were two American submarines, the SS Toledo and the SS Memphis, along with U.S. surface ships and U.S. and Norwegian aircraft monitoring from the skies. The crew on the Kursk was said to be the best in Russia's northern fleet, manning a submarine that was fully armed with granite missiles and torpedoes and was to make a simulated attack on the Kuznetsov. There were no nuclear weapons on board, however. The Kursk's personnel consisted of Captain First Rank Genady P. Lichen, along with 111 crew members, five officers of the 7th SSGN Division headquarters, and two designers. The first day, the 10th, went fine. The Kursk launched a granite missile armed with a dummy warhead. The mission was a success. On the 12th, the plan was to launch more dummy torpedoes, but this time at the Velekia. At about 8.51 a.m., from the flagship Peter the Great, Fleet Admiral Vlicheslav Popov, commander of the Northern Fleet, radioed the Kursk to fire the torpedo. The last word Popov said was good. The launch was good to go. That was the last time the Kursk radioed anyone, although it wouldn't be the last communication from the Kursk. At 11.28 a.m., there was an explosion. The USS Memphis, still monitoring the exercise, picked up the explosion, which was soon followed by a second larger explosion. The explosions rocked the entire exercise area, especially the second one. Our Norwegian seismic monitoring station recorded both. The Piero Velekia, the 28,000-ton battlecruiser, shook at its rudder. That second explosion had measured a 4.2 on the Richter scale, so it was in fact recorded all over Europe. It was about 250 times more powerful than the initial explosion, powerful enough that seismic stations in Canada and Alaska also recorded the shockwave. The Russian submarine, the Karelia, was also monitoring the exercise and felt the shockwaves. It was obvious to the Americans and the Norwegians that something serious had happened, but for the moment the Russians weren't overly concerned. The shockwaves were reported to top military brass, but at first these reports were ignored. There was radio silence, but Popov, 
who was accustomed to breakdowns of communications equipment, wasn't worried just yet. As time passed and radio silence remained, his concern grew. The Northern Fleet Headquarters sent another radio message to Kursk, report your coordinates and operations. No answer. The Russians then dispatched a helicopter to see if the submarine had arisen to the surface, but reported back negative. At 6.30 p.m., the Russians set up a search and rescue post. Soon after, two IL-38 searching aircraft were also dispatched, returning sometime later to the airfield, having not seen anything. The Russians still had no idea what had happened, but they were now more than a bit concerned. Captain Alexander Teslenko, who was in charge of Russia's search and rescue mission, ordered the Mikhail Rudnitsky to be dispatched to look for the Kursk. This was a 20-year-old lumber carrier that had been converted for submersible rescue operations. The Rudnitsky was equipped with two AS-32 and AS-34 PRIS-class deep submergence rescue vehicles. The ship was also carrying a diving bell, lifting cranes, and gear for underwater rescues. But importantly, it wasn't equipped with specialized stabilizers that could keep it in position in stormy weather. As luck would have it, the weather was about to make a turn for the worst, and the Rudnitsky was not up for the job. We can call this mistake number one, although in all honesty mistakes had been made long before the Kursk was put out to sea. The Russians actually had two India-class rescue submarines, and each of those had small rescue submarines capable of reaching a depth of 2,275 feet. But back in 1995, these were put out of action. They were waiting for repairs in St. Petersburg at the time of the disaster. This was post-Cold War, when Russia's finances were extremely tight. It wasn't until 10.30 p.m that the Northern Fleet declared an emergency. It was only then that the naval exercise was properly shut down. Around 20 ships belonging to the Northern Fleet, including about 3,000 sailors, were tasked with search efforts. All of this was fastidiously recorded. One log tells us, 7 p.m., 0.8 kilograms of delicacy canned food, cod liver in its own juice, was issued to the officer's war room. Rescuers started watching artistic videos. It was only the next morning at about 7 a.m. that Popov had told the Kremlin that they had a possible catastrophe on their hands. The vessel had been found on the seabed, but it wasn't certain if the men were alive in it. The Minister of Defense Igor Sergeyev told Vladimir Putin that Sunday morning, but informed the new boss that he shouldn't go to the disaster site. This is where things got strange. The Russian Navy commander Admiral Vladimir Kuraiodev said at one point that there had been signs of a big and serious collision. Kuraiodev later admitted the chances for a positive outcome are not very high. But collided with what exactly? The US Department of Defense, which as you know had been monitoring the exercise, stated that there was no indication that a US vessel was involved in the accident. The US believed there had been an explosion, but it couldn't be ascertained what had caused it. Even though the Russians knew this was now potentially a large-scale catastrophe, Popov spoke to the public that Sunday and called the mission a resounding success. He almost certainly knew at the time that something resoundingly cataclysmic had happened. In reports that followed, the public heard that there had been some minor technical difficulties, but everyone on board is alive. No one knew that, however. Like Chernobyl many years earlier, the Russian bigwigs were keeping this under wraps for as long as possible. It was only on Monday that the Russians publicly admitted that the Kursk was in serious trouble, but even then, the families of the men on the ship were not told anything that resembled the truth. They were also told that the accident happened on Sunday when it happened on Saturday. Attempts to reach the sub were aborted many times. At this point, the Americans as well as France, Germany, Israel, Italy, Norway, and Britain all believed something grave had happened. When they contacted the Russians, they were told the rescue was going fine. Russia refused any assistance. The Russian public certainly didn't want to hear about this, as 118 fine young men were potentially sitting on the seabed 354 feet down. The weather got even worse, so the search was hampered by poor visibility. There was still some hope, although by now the wives and relatives of the men were hearing horrible rumors. They weren't getting the truth from the government or the navy, but word was getting around that their loved ones on that sub were never coming back. The news was getting out to Russian journalists who were using every trick in the book to get their story, bribing officials and even pretending to be part of a rescue team. The families kept being told that all attempts to save the men were being made, but what they weren't being informed about is that many attempts to get the sub were being botched. The equipment wasn't good enough for the job. The bad weather was also playing a big part in making things much harder. At times, the diving bell was thrown around by powerful undersea currents. Things went from bad to worse. One time, one of the rescue vehicles was broken when it was being loaded back into the ship. It was a nightmare scenario for all involved. 
On further attempts, even when they could get to the sub, they couldn't attach the diving bell. Time was running out. It was estimated that the men on the submarine could possibly have enough air until the 18th. That's what the families heard, but later they were told differently, that the men could survive longer. It was on the 18th that the British and Norwegians were finally allowed to join the search. The family still had no idea what was going on. Sometimes reports stated that the crew was sending SOS messages by tapping on the sub. Hearing the little taps of SOS messages were coming from the Kursk was about the best news relatives had in days. But were those knocking sounds men or something hitting the sub from the outside? On the 19th, the Norwegian ship named the Normand Pioneer arrived on the scene carrying the British rescue submarine LR-5. Both the Norwegians and the British complained that the Russians were making their job harder. Vice Admiral E. Skorgen of the Norwegian Navy told a newspaper, from time to time the information given to the Norwegian side was so inauthentic that it threatened the safety of the divers. At one point, the Russians discharged the Brits from the operation altogether, which Paddy Heron of the British team said was repugnant. The Russians were still embracing the secrecy of the Cold War in the year 2000, yet the relatives of the crew heard nothing of this. The Russians said the Brits and Norwegians were making the job impossible. The mood changed on Monday, August 21st at 7.45 a.m. when a Norwegian rescuer opened the upper door of an emergency hatch. He saw no people in the airlock. At 1 p.m., the hatch of the airlock was opened. The sub was completely flooded, and when the divers opened one of the compartments, they found dead bodies scattered everywhere. There were no signs of life anywhere they looked as they checked other compartments. Admiral Popov and Vice Admiral Skorgen had to accept the truth. Everyone was dead. At 9 p.m. that night, the Military Council of the Northern Fleet officially reported the loss of all the crew. The families were informed, wives and children wept, but many were angered on how this whole operation had gone down. What they'd been told didn't make sense. Popov appeared on Russian TV and took off his cap, telling the cameras, forgive me for not saving your sailors. It still wasn't exactly certain who had died on the sub. Not all the names had been announced, although sneaky journalists bribed officials again and soon the names appeared on TV. The Russian Federation asked Norway for further help with the removal of the sailors' bodies. The bodies of the dead were to be removed through eight special holes that were made in the hull. Norway's Stolt offshore company signed a contract for between five to seven million dollars, because this was not going to be an easy operation. While they were in mourning, the relatives of the deceased heard more lies. Most of them were soon taken by the passenger ship Klavdia Yelenskaya to the scene of the incident and informed that absolutely all of the information and the condition of the site was made available to foreign specialists. That wasn't true in the least. The question was, had those foreigners been tasked with the job earlier, would they have found living humans on that sub? Had Russia's stalling cost lives? If it had, the Russian public would have crucified the military as well as the government. Military bigwigs were accused of incompetence. Instead of offering apologies, one of the generals called the journalists traitorous and the Navy personnel who'd spoken to them scum. This was a bad time for Russia and for Putin. In a poll, 60% of Russians said the disaster hadn't changed their support for him, but 27.8% said the disaster had diminished their support for him. Losing almost a third of your voter base in a matter of days isn't exactly great for a political leader. Putin soon discovered that his own military had misled him something he would take out on them in the weeks to come. For now, he had to save his own face, and he did that by offering what the US reported was an unprecedented compensation package to the close relatives of the deceased. This amounted to an apartment and 720,000 rubles, or $26,000. All of the dead were honored with the Order of Valor, while victims got other goodies such as free telephone services and electricity. This was exceedingly generous, given the men were on about $600 a month, and as we mentioned before, many of them hadn't been paid in a while. Even with his public relations save, Putin struggled to wipe the pie from his face. Russia looked bad in the eyes of the world. He looked bad. The military looked totally incompetent. No amount of free phone calls was going to clean up this mess. Some of the widows were suspicious of the kindness. One widow told the press, we get a lot more than Chechen widows, ten times more. The Russian government doesn't give money out like that for nothing. There must be something they're trying to hide. They must feel guilty. Indeed. That question again emerged. Could those men have survived if the Russian Navy hadn't been so incompetent, or their equipment had been better, or more importantly, had Russia allowed the UK and Norway to help earlier in the rescue? Just how fast had those guys died, and what had killed them exactly? 
Just before we tell you this, you should know that what people were saying had happened prior to an official investigation. Of course, there were some wild theories in Russia and also in the West. The main hypothesis was a collision, and less so, the sub hitting a World War II-era mine. Russian officials clung to the collision theory. Some other officials wondered if NATO had struck the sub. And the odd armchair expert believed that a mass poisoning on board or a new secret Russian weapon hitting the submarine led to the disaster. Some even speculated that it was a UFO attack. It seemed Russia was going with the collision story at first. On August 24th, the Russian main office of military prosecutor started proceedings against whoever had caused the accident. This was according to a Clause 263.3 of the Russian Criminal Code, which related to violation of safety traffic regulations on railway, air or water lines, entailed on carelessness, death of two or more persons. Guilty parties could be sent to prison for four to ten years. The officials involved in these proceedings were all under the hammer, so it suited them that a collision rather than equipment faults and their incompetence had killed those men. The worst thing about this investigation was that they led it, their own hand-picked team. Outside investigators were persona non grata. It was high stakes for President Putin, too, faced with what the Washington Post called the first major political crisis of his presidency. These were the days when the US media actually liked Putin, a man some said that the US could do business with. For Putin, only four months into his presidency, this was life or death. He'd been roundly criticized for choosing to stay at a seaside resort at the start of the chaos, a public relations nightmare for a president when your country's in the middle of a disaster. When Putin did finally meet with about 350 relatives of the crew, journalists were not invited. Although some pretended to be relatives, many of the real relatives screamed at him, their eyes filled with tears and their mouths firing off every curse word under the Russian sun. It looked as though they were going to beat the hell out of him. They screamed, who killed our boys? Who will be punished? Putin was under some serious pressure. One woman, Nadezhda Tylik, who was the mother of Kursk submariner Lieutenant Sergei Tylik, was absolutely enraged. She screamed at Putin and the other officials, you better shoot yourselves now, we won't let you live. A nurse then sneaked up behind her and injected her with a sedative. This also became a controversy for Putin. At first, Nadezhda's husband claimed he'd asked the nurse to do that because she, his wife, was prone to excessive emotions. A few months later, Nadezhda told the truth. She said her husband had lied. He hadn't asked anyone for help. The nurse was part of the official gang. Nadezhda told the press, the injection was done to shut my mouth. Immediately after it, I just lost the ability to speak and was carried out. She later told the St. Petersburg Times that Putin did not know how to respond to their questions. She added, they told us lies the whole time, and even now, we're unable to get any information. The Western media picked up on the incident, saying it harkened back to the Cold War days. The Russian response was that it was nothing out of the ordinary. Regarding the Cold War-style injection, the Times newspaper in Britain was told by Russian officials, we are simply protecting the relatives from undue pain. It was for her own protection. A Russian journalist later explained the likely reason why they knocked out Nadezhda. He said, I honestly thought that they would tear him, Putin, apart. There was such a heavy atmosphere there, such a lot of hatred, despair, and pain. I never felt anything like it anywhere in my entire life. Much of the Russian media knew something was amiss, and many newspapers weren't afraid to say it. The Russian newspaper Izvestia wrote, Lies and fears are the features of the Russian authority. When people's lives are involved, admirals, generals, and government officials should not lie, dodge, and think about their own career. This is blasphemy. The officials even took flack from retired Russian military bigwigs, one of whom, Yevgeny Azhnabaev, said, It's become a form of theater. This is a performance for the whole world. Even though a Norwegian company had been contracted to get the dead out of there, the Russians told him that after they drilled the hole in the sub, only Russian divers were allowed inside. This suited the Russian officials, of course. When those Russian divers finally got inside the sub, they did so through compartment 9, although it was difficult to see as there was so much ash in the water. The Russians gradually worked their way through several compartments, greeted on their way by badly burned bodies. This didn't look like a collision. Russian officials were still selling the story that there'd been some sort of collision. They said the vessel had plummeted to the seabed and everyone had pretty much died immediately. Some officials entertained the narrative that the collision had been with a NATO spying submarine. A few of them stuck with this tale for years after the accident, given that anti-Western propaganda was how they stayed in their job. But once the Russian divers found 12 bodies in compartment 9, they knew this had been no collision and the instant death of everyone. 
Those brave men in the compartment had not died straight away. They'd made their way to that compartment, but how long they were alive after the initial event was the question. Some said three days, which would mean they could have been rescued had the foreign teams been able to help earlier. The investigations went on for years, filling 133 volumes. The relatives were then told something that started to sound more like the truth, something that refuted the story that the men had survived more than a few hours in compartment 9. They were informed that the crew had tried to load a dummy torpedo for the training exercise, but a problem with the weld on the torpedo had led to a leak of high test peroxide, which created an explosion. The torpedo manufacturer said outright that there was no way this could have happened. Still, that's the story that the Russian investigators stuck with, and it's the one that does make the most sense to anyone familiar with the story. They said the explosion started a fire and destroyed the bulkhead between the first and second compartments. They said this killed everyone in the control room or at least severely injured them. The much bigger second explosion was caused by five to seven torpedo warheads going off as a result of the first explosion. The sailors people heard had blown themselves up. This second explosion completely wrecked the compartments and tore a massive hole in the hull. The nuclear reactors, it was said, shut down without any problems. Just about everyone was already dead after explosion 2, but 23 men managed to get to compartment 9, where they did indeed survive, but only for about 6 more hours, not a matter of days. It was said the oxygen they were breathing was depleted, so they tried to change to a potassium superoxide chemical oxygen cartridge but it somehow fell into the oily water and that blew up. Some more men were killed instantly, while others either died in the resulting fire or suffocated due to the fire consuming all of their oxygen. The only surviving notes from the sub were found in compartment 9. Captain Lieutenant Dmitry Kolesnikov wrote in one note, It's 1315. All personnel from section 6, 7, and 8 have moved to section 9. 23 people are here. We feel bad, weakened by carbon dioxide. Pressure is increasing in the compartment. If we head for the surface, we won't survive the compression. None of us can escape. Two hours later, he wrote, It's dark here to write, but I'll try by feel. It seems like there are no chances, 10 to 20 percent. Let's hope that at least someone will read this. Here's the list of personnel from the other sections who are now in the ninth and will attempt to get out. Regards to everyone, no need to despair. Kolesnikov. Russia's Izvestia newspaper reported that a note written inside a novel that was wrapped in plastic was found in the pocket of the deceased Lieutenant Commander Rashid Aryapov. The Russian rescue crew said the newspaper had taken the note when it was hoovering up secret documents. Part of it read, faults in the torpedo compartment, namely the explosion of a torpedo on which the Kursk had to carry out tests. This didn't, of course, gel with the collision theory the Russian government peddled for so long initially, which explains why the note went missing. So that was the story, but as you can imagine, it didn't exactly make the families of the dead men feel any better. They all asked what the BBC asked at the time. Why was the state-of-the-art nuclear submarine designed to withstand the full wrath of an enemy fleet so easily destroyed by a practice torpedo, which didn't even have a warhead? And why had the torpedo, which was apparently leaking explosive fuel, not been checked properly? The northern Russian fleet admitted that some mistakes had been made. It was time for the government shuffle. Putin transferred Popyov and the fleet commander chief of staff Mikhail Motsak. Igor Sergeyev resigned as minister of defense, and he was, for the first time in modern Russian history, replaced with someone not from the military, which apparently appalled other members of the military. Had the young Putin lost faith in his generals? During these shuffles, Putin made a point of saying that the collision theory was not true. Another proponent of that theory was Deputy Prime Minister Ilya Klebanov, who'd been sure a foreign sub had hit the Kursk. Putin demoted him to the Minister of Industry, Science, and Technology. Twelve high-ranking military officers got the boot, but in typical authoritarian style, Putin said it had nothing to do with the disaster. The relatives were still furious. They'd heard there'd been stunning breaches of discipline, shoddy, obsolete, and poorly maintained equipment, as well as negligence, incompetence, and mismanagement. Relatives became even more angered when they heard about the escape capsules on the Kursk, which evidently couldn't have been used. Then Vice Admiral Valery Rizantsev said the unsayable when he told the world those men on the sub were barely trained, while the sub had been poorly maintained and inspections had been infrequent which was likely why the crew made the mistake that led to the initial explosion. The crew had been taught all the maintenance routines that had to happen before firing off a torpedo, but the Kursk hadn't fired one before that fateful day for three whole years. Books were written about the incident and documentaries were made. 
Even after the official theory had been presented, alternative theories spread through the internet like wildfire. People blamed the two Dagestani weapon specialists on board, saying they were actually Chechen terrorists. Russia was at war with Chechnya at the time of the incident and remained at war until 2009. There were other theories that the Russian government certainly didn't want to be proven true. According to the book Democratic Breakdown and the Decline of the Russian Military, some journalists in the West as well as inside Russia claimed that they had evidence that the Kursk had been blown up after the battlecruiser Peter Velikitya accidentally launched a torpedo at it. The Russian Navy called this an invention, and to this day it seems that's true. Even so, we'll never know for sure what caused the explosions. We know they happened, but we can't be sure why they happened. It could have been mutiny, it could have been an accidental attack. Once the government started lying, the theory started expanding. As that book we just mentioned stated, the dearth of credible information undoubtedly contributed to the many absurd conspiracy theories. In a poll in 2000, 79% of Russians interviewed ticked a box saying the government was hiding the reasons for the tragedy. Only 11% said they were confident the government was telling the truth. It's often said the late, great George Orwell once wrote, in times of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. It's a good quote to end our video with, but accrediting it to Orwell is itself probably part of a conspiracy theory. Now you need to watch a classic, Chernobyl nuclear explosion disaster explained hour by hour. Or have a look at an American disaster, Apollo 13 space mission disaster hour by hour.